Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome back to now session 1.2, which is a country experiences. Are you all there? Can you hear me? It's all quiet. Yes, I can. You can. Okay. 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 Yes. Yeah, already. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for this session, we'll have uh, five papers. This is uh, more talking about country experiences. The first paper is, uh, it will be on uh, effect of tornado, but the remaining three papers will be on uh, disease situation, planters experience, everything. And finally, at the end of the session, we'll have a paper from Dr. Wasana on the preparedness of the Sri Lankan rubber sector to minimize impact of climate change. So it's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Chen Bangian, who is from the Ch Katas, China, to present his paper on tornado disaster assessment of rubber plantations in Western Hainan Island using time series images of Landsat and Sentinel-2. So please, uh, may I just request the speakers, uh, you are allotted 15 minutes, so we'll have some time to have a discussion at the end of this session. So please, Dr. Chen, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, please. So can I share the screen? Okay. So can you see the screen? Not yet, not yet. Okay. Uh, we can hear you, but we cannot Good see afternoon. presentation slide. You say the screen? Not yet. Okay, can we start? Can, is it in already? Can we start? Not yet. You can start now. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's a great honor for me to share my listening study here. The topic is to the disaster assessment of law plantation in Western Highland Island using Landsat and Center 2 time series images. This is the outline. We have four sections. Now let's turn to the first section. China has about 1 million and 157 hectares of law plantation. It's ranked third in the world. There are three production base in China, in Hainan Island, Yunnan Province, and Guangdong Province. All these regions mm -hmm. are face serious natural disasters. For example, in Yunnan Province. Uh, excuse me, in, excuse me, Dr. Chen. Can yeah. you just check because we cannot see your presentation slides? You can't see the presentation. No, we cannot see. Okay, Just I will check try. You in, uh... Otherwise, we can present can it see? from the tech support. Can you see the screen now? Still cannot see. You can't see? No. So I will show see. once again. Something on top there, what is it? Can you see the screen? Ah, yes. Thank you very much. Now we can see, we can see the slides. We can hear you clearly. Please proceed. <laughs> okay, I will uh, throw on this. The third slider. Okay. Yes. yes. Clear, can you clear. see the screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. In Highland Island, the um, typhoon was the primary natural disasters. On the fake, I show some route of typhoon from 1950s and to 2006. You can see a lot of typhoon here and they bring huge damage to rubber industry. One of the latest disasters is a tornado that triggered by tropical storm Pudu. Uh, it was hit in Western Highland Island in 2019, August 29. It has killed 80 people and it destroyed a lot of raw plantation. It damage reached uh, 2.27 million US dollars. Now, remote sensing is the most powerful ways for large scale disaster assessment and the challenge and the opportunity are coexist. 
They increased the number of satellites, improved resolution, more open access, remote sensing big data, and com cloud computation resource are the opportunities. However, lab trees are planted in chalk area, so the cloud contamination in optical images and limited the SAR data and the frequent landscape and land use change are the challenges. In this study, we want to use a case study to show the monitoring the damage of log plantation caused by tornado using remote sensing big data. So why we choose tornado? Because it's a latest disaster with Landsat and the twin satellite of center to A and B. And the damage of tornado is quite similar to the typhoon. Both are bring fast physical destruction to the log plantation. So we want to answer three questions. Firstly, when is the ideal monitoring time? And how to use the dense time series images? And what are the best monitor indicators? Now let's turn to the second sections. This is our st uh, study area. It's located in, uh, west, in Western Highland Island. It's across Danzo City and Baisa County. First regions are the core production area of Highland Island. The elevation in most regions are below 200 meters above the sea level. After the tornado hit, we quick, quickly carried out a field survey. Here are some photos taken by our group members. We marked the damaged lab, plant, lab plantations using Google Earth very high resolution satellite images. The left images show the plantation before the tornado, while the right uh, images show the uh, plantation after the tornado. The plantation destroyed by the tornado has updated. We use this for training the algorithm. We use two satellite uh, data. One is land set seven and eight, or rather is center two A and B. The center two B was launched in 2017. So after it launched, the image acquire ability increased significantly. We can see uh, the image account for my study area from 2015 to 2019. You can see the number of center two images almost doubled in 2008 and 2009. That's bring our huge opportunity for um, disaster assessment. For image proceeding, we have three main steps. First is quantity control, and the second is vegetation index calculation, and the third is image composite. Uh, that's a popular way for disaster assessment. There are two ways. One is the traditional way. That is used uh, to cloud free satellite images. One is before the disaster and another is after the disaster. Then we get the difference images and use the ground reference to determine the threshold and the algorithm. And finally, uh, create a disaster assessment uh, map. However, in this study, we use time series big data. So we want to know how long that is the time window we admit the monitor uh, uh, requirement and how to complete the time series to one and uh, which is the best indicator to identify the disasters. Now let's turn to the third sections. We firstly quickly evaluate the cloud coverage of the study area. You can see a lot of cloud in the study area, in, in chop area. So we use 10 days as time step um, before the, uh, the tornado and after the tornado. We evaluate the coverage, the cloud-free image coverage. We found about 30 days. 
of the crowd free image can cover the whole area, and the MLE peaks is about three times, and in 60 days is about six times, and in 90 days about uh, is greater than eight times. So we have a lot of satellite imaging now. Here we show the indicator and the complete message of different tornado uh, before the tornado. The, the left images show the absolute change before and after the tornado. And the right images show the percentage of change value of the different indicator uh, before and after disaster. We have uh, four different composite way. One is the latest, maximum, minimum, and medium. And there are the different day lengths, 30 days, 60 days, and 19 days. We found that the short wave influence band increased after the tornado, where the near infrared band, the four in vegetation index, NDVI, EVI, SW, and MBR dropped uh, significantly. Among this vegetation index, the, EV, the value of EVI dropped the most, and the percentage value of SWI dropped the most. And among these composite, different composite ways, the maximum, maximum value composite shows the largest difference before and after the disaster, then followed by medium, by the uh, latest composite shown in red. So why the latest composite message have the, the maximum value composite show the largest difference? Because the tornado is hit in glowing season. So the maximum value composite can capture the latest glowing states of log plantation. Here is the uh, figure shows the different composite way after the tornado. We can say that the different uh, composite way has more difference. The minimum value composite that show in blue has the largest uh, difference, then followed by medium value composite. And the, uh, the EVI and SW will show the uh, largest difference than the NDVI, which is quite uh, is commonly used in current study, in previous study. So we get two good indicators. Uh, one is the EVI, or other is ASWI, and the, um, two different composite way, maximum before the disaster, and the minimum after the disaster or mid medium, uh, when it comes out of the disaster. So we want to know the um, best time window. So we use for, um, 10 days as a time step and uh, found that after uh, about 40 days, the difference before and after the disaster it becomes stable. However, we recommend you let the image show within 60 days and after the process. We have a sufficient uh, before and after the maximum, medium, and medium. Among this, uh, vegetation index, among this vegetation index, the maximum, maximum value complete show the complete is the best, then is the maximum medium followed by medium, medium complete by the ground reference. Here we show the different complete way, but there's a special change. We found that. Uh, for the medium performance, also they show clear root of the tornado. But the mass and medium value composite, they have a lot of low level, especially for the EVA. The mass and medium have a lot of low levels. It's over, it supports the circular uh, come from the disaster itself. This is the change value. Here, is, this is the percent change value. They have show similar pattern like the uh, change value. Among this, we found that the maximum medium value composite shows the best performance. The clear shows the root of Why the 
minimum when you compensate up the throttle uh, for the EVI is, is a lot of works well because in the EVI in the glowing season change greatly than the air supply. In the air supply in the glowing season almost unchanged. So air supply is better for uh, disaster assessment using percentage value. Here we can draw us as three uh, conclusions. Yes, the time window is better to use uh, 60 days before and after the disaster using land safe seven and eight and the center two A and B satellite images. And the uh, maximum, maximum venue composite before the disaster and minimum venue composite after disaster are recommended. And the EVI or SWI percentage venue are the best indicators. So use these two best indicator and uh, composite way, we evaluated the disaster loss of the log plantation. We found the two uh, algorithm created similar results at the town scale. The total damage uh, area of log plantation range from 576 hectare to 712 hectare. Here, this uh, the overlap with Google very high resolution satellite images. The green area, green pixels are the shared, um, shared area, while the um, blue is the EVA algorithm only, and the air supply is, uh, and the red is air supply only. So, if we want to get very high uh, <coughs> accuracy results, some manual adjustment is necessary. Now let's turn to the conclusion. Increasing in extreme weather and later disaster on the climate change pose huge challenges to log industry. However, remote sensing big data bring us a lot of opportunity for disaster assessment. For tornado or typhoon disaster of log plantation, we recommend using uh, six days of uh, land set seven and eight and sent to A and B images for disaster assessment to save the com computation resource and also uh, for the find the best uh, find the um, optimal uh, difference before and after the disaster and the maximum value composite before the disaster and the medium value composite after the and we found the EVI and SWI are the best indicators, much better than um, current and widely used uh, indicator NDVI. That's all. Thank you. Dr. Chen, I think now we'll go to the please. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, write down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the second. I can't hear you. If if the there are questions, you can. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chen. I think we move to the next paper. This will be uh, presented by Mr. Ash Deepak Singh, who is the estate manager of Peninsula Forest Management, Sindrian Berhad, in Selangor, Malaysia, and he will be speaking on climate change, uh, planters' experience with disease outbreaks and the challenges to achieve productivity targets. Are you around, Mr. Ashdipak? Yes, good uh, evening, Dr. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Okay, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, good evening, friends. Uh, it's uh, 4.45 p.m. in Malaysia. So I'll be sharing a screen. Okay. Okay, screen yeah. can be seen, right? You can see your, your presentation slides already. Okay. Please proceed. So uh, it's a planter's experience with disease outbreaks and the challenges to achieve uh, productivity targets. Uh, this is how the estate condition looks like. Okay, 
Uh, the rubber plantation project site is located about 60 kilometer to the north of Kuala Lumpur, 20 kilometer from the north of town of Kuala Kubu Baru, and 10 kilometer from south of Tanjung Malim Perak town, hugging both sides of the North South Highway. The best access to the area is through the highway exit Lamba Brigade Selangor, a semi abandoned township bordering the rubber plantation. Currently, the plantation has successfully planted 1,530 hectares of uh, rubber plantation from 2009 to 2011. The clones which are currently planted are such. We have PB350 with the highest planting, which is uh, 76%. Then we have PB260, 13%. RRIM2025, 5%. RRIM3001, there's a zero known as One Malaysia, 3%. And we have RRIM901, 3%. This clone was planted from 2009 to 2011. We are also in plan to plant another 3,000 hectares of rubber plantation, which will be from 2021 to 2025. Rainfall data by year. This is our rainfall data for Lemba Bringin Slango. We take our rainfall data using a rain gauge, which uh, we have in every single phase. This is very important for planters actually. Many estates do not do this. When they do not capture the rainfall, they will not be able to plan their coming yield for the years. So if you can see 2017, we have a rainfall of 184 days. For 2018, a rainfall of 186 days. For 2019 is 173 days. From January 2020 to May 2020 is 64 days. If you see the rainfall at this area is quite high, it's about 3,381 mm. It's around 3,000 mm per year. This is how we capture the rainfall by month. So if you can see uh, climate change in, in Lebar, Ringin, Slango, it's not much of a change because the rainfall is uh, it's standard actually, it's, it's, it's the same for every year except for January. January there's 14 days of uh, rainfall in 2017, for 2018 is 16 days, for 2019 is 12 days and for 2020 is 5 days. So this happened, when this happened, the wintering season will be brought forward, it will be delayed by a month. This is the rainfall chart by month from January 2017 to May 2020. So if you can see uh, in February, it's about five days, January, February. In March, April, it will hit to 20 days. And then it's, it slides back down all the way. This is the rain gauge we use, uh, which you can see on your right hand side, it's called Nilex. It's a very good device for whoever owns a rubber plantation to capture the rain, uh, rain data. Okay, the challenges uh, we face, the challenges we face in the uh, estate during raining season, this is the main challenges. Unable to tap, we lose tapping days, Wash up unless latex coagulant is applied immediately after tapping for feed coagulant or known as rubber kaplam in layman's term. Like for my plantation, we do not do latex, we do feed coagulant. Uh, it's, it's also known as a kaplam. Workers tapping without knowledge during raining season causing brown bus. Brown bus is the second most serious threat to rubber estates after pestalotias, after pestalotia from an estate's perspective of view. Unable to achieve monthly yield and fail to fulfill yearly targets. Rubber tapping will be done rigorously during dry months to compensate for raining days. However, this method has been known to cause critical stress to rubber trees, and resulting in fast decrease in the tree's latex production or ending up in panel dryness and brown bus. When earning of tappers is low during raining season, it will lead to workers running away or becoming free birds, which will further cause shortage of workers in the rubber industry, which currently is already a major problem for most of the rubber industries in Malaysia. Shortage of workers is considered a main problem for 
Rubber Industry in Malaysia. So how we encounter to make sure that we can have a proper productivity to ensure that we tackle this uh, rainy season problem. So like my estate, we have uh, we have been using this uh, rain guard. It's called Easy Guard. It was invented and patented by a company called Gamecrust. Easy Guard is designed to divert rainwater running down the tree tapping panel, which prevents the water from touching the tapping panel and keep the panel dry. Example, tapping starts at 3 a.m. and there was rain at 9 p.m. a day earlier. The tap will be able to tap the tree because the panel is still dry. Rain, rain guard is very common in most of the countries. It's just that what type of rain guard you use. So basically, uh, this is the rain guard we use. It's called Easy Guard. The cost of material is quite cheap. It's about 61 cents. The labor for fixing this uh, rain guard is about 45 cents per tree. The break even of cost is two tapping days. It means if you per tree, you tap for two tapping days, you'll be able to cover the rain guard's cost. Many small holders, they do not invest in rain guard where they will lose the tapping days. So the major, major setback to gain uh, your productivity is to install rain guard. It's very important. So this is how you install a rain guard on a small tree. This is how you install a rain guard on a large tree. I'll show you how it works. This is how the rain guard works. This is called easy guard. This is called, this black uh, bag is called a sealant, also known as star in Malaysia. So, and you have a stapler. So you install it about three to four inches from the tapping panel above. So when rain happens, right, it will divert the rainfall. It will not touch the panel. You'll be able to tap if it's not a heavy downpour. This is how it looks. Uh, the main problem in estates after Pesta Lotia is brown bass. I don't know if we have uh, spoken about it yet or if anyone is going to speak about it. Brown bass uh, is also known as panel dryness. Physiological disease of tree characterized of greenish brown or greenish brown discoloration of the inner bark near the tapping cut and stoppage in flow of latex. Tapping panel dryness or known as brown bass plantation practices. Our plantation practices, if we are hit by brown bars, we will let the tree rest for six months and try tapping after six months. There are many products uh, throughout the world where claims that brown bars can be healed, but not proven so far. So this method for estates is proven. After six months, we will apply one round of booster dose at 1.25%, uh, also known as atrial. This is how we encounter our brown bus. In plantation, right, we start planting with 500 trees per hectare. At the end of year six, right, it will left out with about 450. Some dies with pink disease, termites, root disease. And this problem of uh, brown bus is also another, another major problem. Because when you have unskillful tapper and contract tappers, who prioritize the money taken back rather than taking care of a rubber tree. The main problem encountered by Malaysian estates is when we stress the tree for higher output, we should, the lifespan of a rubber tree should, should be, to, we should be able to tap for 20 years, but when we exploit the tree, it may only survive for 10 years. It's a major problem for our rubber estates after the start of year, of course. So this is an image taken from Google. Source was 2004 from Julian Manuel, Baba Gomez, Samsida, Hamza, and H. Gana Mati. This is how the back like toilets looks like. Okay, this is an actual picture taken from my plantation. On the right here, you can see it's taken on 9 June 2020. I took it myself. This tree has already have panel dryness, also known as brown bus. Picture showing brown bus tree with a brown bus. So this is a video I've taken uh, to show you that once we 
have a cut on uh, rubber tree, there will not be there will not be any more latex there at least for six months. And this is a major setback for rubber plantation. Out of five hundred trees, fifty trees, sixty trees is affected by brown bus. This is mainly because of unskillful tappers, contract tappers, and when you stress the tree, it means you tap the tree during the rainy season or when the panel is wet, or you over tap. I'll show you the video. So this was the video. Then we have uh, Pestalotia, of course, one of the most hot topic for every rubber plantation in Malaysia. My estate, uh, we have been hit by Pestalotia in July 2019 to October 2019. So we were hit at about 657 hectares. The actual hectares, the affected area was 267 hectares, which is 41%. So our yield was affected by 25% due to Pestalotia. This is a major problem for rubber industry, actually. So the treatment we have followed, uh, Malaysian Rubber Board's recommendation to how to treat the trees. I'll show you how, what, what uh, treatment we use and how we encounter this uh, Pestalotia. This is uh, recently actually, the same location happened in May 2020 up to 14 June 2020. We are still hit by Pestalotia. We are hit at about 67%. But this time, the area affected is not much. It's about 58 hectares. So we are in the process of doing the treatment. We estimate the yield will fall at about 40% due to Pestalotia because the leaf which can be seen on the branches is less than 30%. This is how uh, the estate management, the estate operation encounter and record down their, their data for Pestalotia. So when they do the treatment, uh, which week we were advised to do treatment on a weekly basis by Mission Rubber Board. So we are following their recommendation. This is the treatment used by us. It's called Kenlet. It has Benmoil 50%, the active ingredient. So this is the ratio how you spray on the trees of Pestalotia. This is how the pestal rotate have affected the rubber estate. You can see here the leaf all over the ground, like blanket. And on this image, you can see that there is no much leaves left on the branches. This is uh, from 2019. This is uh, recently, this is also from 2019. Uh, just a short video here to let you see how the leaf fall. It's basically the leaf fall is is even worse during rainy season or heavy heavy wind. So I'll just play a short video for you. So we, uh, this is how we treat uh, the Pestalotia. We use mechanical sprayer. Mechanical sprayer, we have a water tank of 2,000 liters. We will attach a 
sprayer to the tractor and the tractor move around. You need two people to carry out this uh, this job. So this is Pesta uh treatment in video. How we do it for your reference. So, how to increase uh, productivity for workers? This is how you increase productivity basically uh, workers, time, sun, rain and recovery period monitoring of workers monitoring of working hours for tappers to achieve the highest yield tappers are advised to start tapping at 3 a.m and to avoid tapping after 9 30 a.m avoid tapping during sunlight due to the panel will dry and the text flow will be very slow and not worth the effort stressing the tree may also lead to panel dryness and lead to brown mass to do recovery tapping, management can also, can also have a policy to carry out recovery tapping on high raining days. Recovery tapping can be in the evening or switch from D3 to D2 tapping. This is another method. Example, on Monday, suppose to tap section A, but it started raining at 1 a.m. That particular section can be tapped in the evening and the next day, section B can be tapped so that we don't lose the tapping days. Another method of recovery tapping is also to switch from D3 to D2. Tapping can be tapped at 1.5 tasks a day to recover for a lost days. Number of trees per task must be considered as well. Normally, in normal circumstances in plantation, we say that we can tap for 300 days. That's 100% tapping. 365 days, we last 52 Sundays is 313 days. 11 days of public holiday, we left with 302 days. D3 tapping, we will get about 100 tapping days per year. For D2 tapping, we will get 150 tapping days per year. However, if you achieve plus minus 95% out of tappers outturn, or 200 tapping days is a good output for the plantation. The management of the plantation plays a very important role on how the recovery plan is executed. Rain guard plays an important role as well. Uh, mainly for Malaysia because we have uh, high rainfall except for Kedah and Malacca and some other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And this is a visit hosted by Peninsula. I see Dr. Aziz and all the team is there. It was in uh, 12 September 2019. And this is the receipt to check the quality of the process of the collection for field problem. That was a short presentation from me. Any questions, welcome. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much, uh, Mr. Ashdipak. We will do the question later towards the end. Okay. Okay, okay. thank, thank you, you very much. Can we move to the next paper? It's also a disease. Uh, Dr. Tri Rapani. Fabianti from uh, Palembang, Indonesian Rubber Research Institute. She's a senior researcher there. And her title is Climate Change and its Impact on the Outbreak of Pestalotiopsis Epidemic of Fever in South Sumatra. Okay, Dr. Fabi, welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dato. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, good. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I would like to present my research paper. The title of this research is Climate Change and Its Impact on Outbreak of Pestalotiopsis Epidemic of Hevea in South Sumatra. In Indonesia, have more than 25 kinds of disease. This disease attack the root, uh, stem, leaf, branch, and also tapping funnel. And in Indonesia, have 12 kinds of leaf disease, 
and four is important lip disease and one become outbreak in the last two years is pestalotiopsis lipo disease. It is a time disease incident in Indonesia. We can see in here almost a rubber disease occur in the wet season, white root disease only in wet season, and pestalotiopsis in dry season and also wet, wet season. When the lip become mature. And my prediction, this disease will always come every year like other leaf disease. Pestalotiopsis first occur in the North Sumatra region since 2009, uh, 2016, then spread to the Southern Sumatra region at the end of 2017 until now. It is affected area of this disease. In July 2019, uh, more than 386,000 hectares affected area of this disease. And it is canopy condition due to pestalotiopsis. We can see in here, in 2019, attack began in January and Canopy fell from January, continues fall until wintering, and wintering in June and July. But it is different condition uh, with uh, 2020, where climate change occur and effect of El Nino make long dry season compared to previous year. So the canopy condition can be good and last more than two months. So the peak pro production uh, in March and April, we can get. We see in here, it is a production uh, in 2017, uh, the line, uh, the red line, the red line in 2017, there was no incident. I mean, uh, uh, not yet incident uh, pestalotiopsis in southern Sumatra. In 2018 January, attack began to occur. Uh, the yellow line, and production continues to decline. Same with uh, 2019, uh, uh, red line in January, production decline in 2019 is more than 30% compared to uh, uh, 2017. And how to 2020? We can see in here, the blue line, production continues to increase until May. Pestalotiopsis attack occur in March, and the peak of the attack occur on 18 and 19 April. So the canopy can be good and last until May. The peak production we can get in April and May. This is the rainfall data we can see in here in 2019. 2019 is the yellow line from September. From September to November, rainfall is very little. Usually, symptoms begin in November. And canopy begin to fall in January uh, 2020. But because a very little rainfall, symptoms have not been seen in November and only seen in March 2, 2020. But we must be careful if the rainfall is more than 100 mm per month. This is intensity will be severe if rainfall more than 300 mm per month. It is the same with humidity. We can see 
2019, 2019, the yellow line from September to November, the humidity is very low compared to previous years. And this is number of fallen leaf due to pestalotiopsis. We have a fallen leaf container measuring one square meter is rectangular shape. We can see the highest number of fallen leaf in May. The peak of this disease was on 18 and 19 April 2020, and the number of fallen leaf was recorded in May. Now, I try to study hourly climate data to get more concrete info why sporadic symptoms appear on April in 18 and 19, 2020. So, as in some of my previous slides, climate change on disease development can make the basis of time to, to controlling or application of fungicide so that the canopy can last until the peak of production, namely March and April, or climate can be used as early warning system, but we need epidemiological observation for at least five until 10 years. So we get early warning system model for this disease. This is a, a just case example of Colletotrichum leaf fall disease. We can see in here, they are condition, they are suitable and not suitable for development of pathogen. And when the suitable to development of pathogen, epidemic will be a cure. And most colletotrichum incident occur in the wet season. And the wet season in 1984, wet season in 1973, and only little normal uh, season epidemic. It is for long observation, the, quest, the equation of this disease has been formulated and become early warning system in anticipation of this disease. So this can be applied also to pestalotiopsis need more observation. It is canopy condition uh, due to pestalotiopsis. We see in April 2019, canopy is thin, not good, different from April 2020. Canopy is still good and result good production. And it is, I want to show a uh, condition canopy. Sorry. Canopy condition from the ground cover. We can see very uh, canopy very thin, not good, only stem and branch. Also, all condition like this.
and the ground cover many leaves fall in here. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Conclusion in this study, disease control is very important to be implemented to overcome the various attack of the next disease. The time of application of fungicide need to be considered in order to be on target. Need epidemiological observation of disease so that it become the basis for early warning system. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Fabi, now we will proceed to the next one on North Sumatra. Zaida. Dr. Zaida Fairuza from the Indonesian Rubber Research Institute, Management of Pestalotiopsis Outbreak in North Sumatra, rubber plantation, commercial rubber plantation. Okay. Thank you, Datuk. Yeah. Uh, can you see Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, very clear. Your voice also very clear. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining in my presentation. It's great to see you all. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jade Puza, plant pathologist from Indonesian Rubber Research Institute. The purpose of the presentation is to show you how serious the pestalotopsis outbreak in North Sumatra and how is the management to control this disease. First, I will explain to you about how the climate change affects uh, to the pestalotopsis outbreak incidence. If you can see here the position or location of North Sumatra in Indonesia, rubber plantation in North Sumatra is about uh, for 409,088 hectares. And here, the climate patterns, one area in North Sumatra. If you can see, in 2015 and 2016, uh, it has dry month uh, every year. But in 2017, there's no dry months. If you can see, dry months, according to Smith Ferguson, is the rainfall is about uh, less than 60 millimeters. And this global climate change uh, trigger the, uh, the break of the pestalotiopsis. With the symptoms like this, first uh, the leaves become yellowing and then all, all the leaves fall. With the symptoms like this, same with uh, the symptoms show in uh, Malaysia, from picture of uh, Mr. Asdipa. And the uh, plants look like this, just like uh, the plant, just like a brown, uh, a broom. So there's no leaf uh, in the canopy. Okay, this is the impact of the pesticides outbreak. If you can see the annual yield kg per hectare, if we compare from 2016 and 2019, almost 600 difference. So the decrease really, uh, really big uh, kg per hectare. And if we compare the, uh, the yield um, month by month, we can see uh, if we compare 2016 to 2018, in October, the decreasing is almost about 31%. Per, so the, uh, it's in, the de it's dis decreasing really, really big in, uh, in a rubber plantation. Here's the chronology of pestalotopsis outbreak in North Sumatra. If you have ever heard that the first pestalotopsis uh, occurred in 2017, actually, uh, we, we found in North, North Sumatra the first recorded 
a picture or symptom is in 2016. But there's no outbreak there, only the symptom uh, in the in the leaf. And then 2017, there is outbreak uh, in since June until December, and even until now. If we connect into the climate change or the climate pattern, we can uh, connect in that more rainfall, uh, more rainfall than more humid in the planted uh, in the area. And 2018. The plant before is not uh, is not too susceptible susceptible to oidium and quadricum, but recently it become uh, more susceptible. Maybe uh, after the outbreak and uh, the attack of pestilences make the plants weaker than before. And in 2019, uh, same as uh, the southern Sumatra, uh, North Sumatra also have. El Nino uh, in August or September. So maybe it can, uh, maybe it inhibited the pathogen until next year, until we have a normal or annual wintering in January. But now in 2020, the pathogen is still pandemic because we, uh, we just found the symptom uh, in the area and some area uh, already has a poor canopy. That's really poor. This is the this is some management strategies we recommend as integrated uh, control to pestalotopsis outbreak. There is fogging, fogging application, ground spraying, and fertilizing. But again, uh, the rubber price uh, determine the the uh, consideration of the rubber plantation company to choose the one uh, cheapest uh, technique. So here's the choose the cheapest technique is uh, fogging. If we can see uh, for the cost for labor and all the all the materials, it's only have total 8.19 US dollar. And if if they combine uh, with uh, ground spraying, they should uh, add about uh, 14, or, uh, 14 or almost 15 US dollar. And if we if they do fertilizing, it it will cost about 88.9.35 US dollar per hectare. So that will be uh, cost uh, in in the plantation company. Uh, in in North Sumatra, uh, a commercial plantation uh, company decide to to do control uh, decide to control this disease by using com combination uh, fogging and. Uh, fogging and ground spraying, but the effective uh, technique they use is uh, fogging. And we put a trial plot in one area, and we observe uh, and we observe month by month with uh, five observation parameters: from disease severity, uh, leaf leaf falls using leaf traps, with uh, and also spores. Spore strap with spore, uh, spore strap in the area with three heads in uh, half meters from the surface ground and five meters and then ten meters and also the the four observation parameters is the yield and the fifth is uh, the light intensity we use the light uh, intensity apps from a uh, play store uh, so we can uh, and we make we make same uh, perception by uh, by by using integration so it's it's gadget it's gadget will will take the same uh, will take the same uh, intensity uh, the light intensity in one area 
So we get the results like this. The, the uh, this is about uh, one month after application. The application in um, in clone PB two six O and year twenty two thousand thirteen. So the disease priority in treatment area only thirteen. 13.33 percent, uh, and non-treatment area almost 26.11 percent, twice higher than the treatment area. The treatment area uh, is only with fogging, and non-treatment uh, is non-fogging or uh, control. And the uh, second result is the fallen leaves in the leaf trap. Actually, at that time we collect the data is uh, still the development the development time for medium because uh, the the leaf period the leaf uh, the leaf stage is still uh, copper brown and uh, yellow and apple green, so uh, we get more oidium than uh, pestalotiopsis in there. But from the data, we can see that uh, the treatment have uh, had effect had effect to the leaf disease, even that oidium have or pestalotiopsis. We can see that uh, oidium have forty one uh, leaves, uh, forty one leaves with symptom oidium in treatment, uh, and one. 111 leaves falls in non-treatment. Uh, and pestalotiopsis in treatment only one, and in non-treatment there is four. This is the average, uh, the average of the data in leaf trap. And about spores trap, we can see in treatment area we only get three uh, spores: only oidium, uh, coletotricum, uh, and helminthosporium. But in non-treatment, we get even five, five uh, pathogen. There is oidium, colatotricum, helminthosporium, porinospora, and also pestalotiopsis. And if we, if we can see the yield uh, in the area, we can see that there is a different. This is the GTT, uh, GTT dry. There is about 2.7 different uh, between the treatment and the non-treatment. So the treatment is better than treatment. And if the light intensity, intensity we can see the light intensity in non-treatment, even the light uh, intensity almost 41, 41,000. Whereas uh, in treatment only 19,000 lux. So it uh, it can show us that the canopy really thin in the non-treatment area. And here the picture of the area. The area, the treatment and non-treatment we put side by side. So we can see this is the treatment area really dark in. Uh, really dark below and non-treatment area really really bright and we can see the canopy really poor here the position really side by side and that's the uh, the effect of the the application of fogging maybe that the final of my presentation thank you for all uh, attention and we we would like to add a question thank you very thank much, you Dr. thank you thank you very much uh, Zaida meanwhile there are already questions for Mr. Deepak huh? you you can see in the drop box questions for you and also one for uh, Dr. Chen on Tornado so maybe you can respond to that while we go to the last paper uh, this is from Dr. Wasana Vijay Surya from the Rubber Research Institute of Sri Lanka. Uh, preparedness of the Sri Lankan rubber sector to minimize the impact of climate change. So Dr. Wasana, are you there? She is also a licensed officer of socioeconomic for the RDB. 
Oh yeah, she's really really. Dr. Wasana, we can see your slides, but we cannot hear your voice. Look at Dr. Abdul Aziz, ladies and yes, ladies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Happy to hear from you. Yeah, we can see your, your slides already. Okay, welcome. <laughs> And uh, my presentation today is titled uh, Preparedness of the Sri Lankan Rubber Sector to Minimize the Impacts of Climate Change. Uh, the basic focus of this presentation is to demonstrate uh, to what extent uh, RRASs, uh, I mean our institutions, R&D program fits into the National Adaptation Plan on Climate Change of Sri Lanka. Uh, as you all know, Sorry. And uh, this uh, climate change adaptation plan, uh, which is, uh, I, I should say, the most logical step, because we also had some other conventions like uh, National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy for Sri Lanka, that came the National Climate Change Policy. And the recent one is this uh, National Adaptation Plan for Climate Change Impacts in Sri Lanka, uh, which is for the period 2016 to 2025. And this uh, document has laid out national initiatives for meeting the adverse effects of climate change. And uh, I would like to say that uh, RRI Sri Lanka has been involved in research in various disciplines in developing adaptation measures to adverse uh, climate change impacts, uh, although in absence of this national adaptation plan, and also in the process of developing the knowledge base for carbon sequestering ability to prove the prospects in receiving carbon credits. And we are, uh, uh, there's a project going on uh, establishing rubber plantation projects, rubber cultivation projects for the voluntary carbon market in the non-traditional rubber growing areas in the eastern and rural provinces. And uh, it is, uh, rather than doing ad hoc research, it is always good to follow a systematic way by adopting the National Adaptation Plan for Climate Change Impacts. And this uh, particular document has identified nine vulnerable sectors, including uh, the plantation sector, and rubber is contained in the export development section. And uh, this can identify adaptation options, this report, that can fulfill these needs and actions necessary to achieve these adaptation options. And this is a, uh, I mean, stake, this uh, uh, report, was prepared with stakeholder participation and even uh, officers from the Rubber Research Institute also participated in uh, documenting this report. There are four relevant adaptation needs for the natural rubber sector as per this uh, national adaptation strategy. The first one being enhancing the resilience of the rubber sector against heat and water stress. Then the second is minimizing the risk of crop damage due to biological agents. The third being minimizing the impact on export earnings due to erratic changes in precipitation. And the final one is enhancing resilience of export crops and agroecosystems to extreme weather events. So let's uh, move on to the first one, which is enhancing uh, the resilience against heat and water stress. And here the key area is germplasm improvement and also improvement of nursery and plantation management practices. Uh, the breeding of new clones include multiple 
application, establishment and scientific evaluation of heavy agent plasm, molecular level screening to identify drought tolerant clones, and RRASL smallholder collaborative trials, uh, mainly in suboptimal environments, uh, to test adaptability and performance. Uh, again, regarding breeding of new clones, there are some success stories. The clones RRSL 217 and RRSL 215 have been identified as highly stable for all environments. So that means it's good for even dry climates. And through molecular screening, RRSL 2005 and RRSL 2006 are more tolerant to drought compared to the other clones tested. But we need further research to confirm uh, these findings. Uh, then how to enhance in the resilience of the rubber sector against heat and water stress again, uh, considering the improvement of nursery and plantation management practices. These are the areas that are being focused by RRS Sri Lanka in the uh, process of finding adaptation measures, suitable adaptation measures. Uh, they are improved planting material, priming of seeds to improve germination success, application of botanicals and physiochemicals, mainly to uh, avoid uh, water stress, irrigation practices to reduce moisture stress, and studies on potting media for root trainers, biofertilizer development, etc. And uh, more on to this aspect, uh, we do research on use of organic fertilizer, biochar application, intercropping systems and soil moisture conservation practices uh, with the objective of avoiding stress situations. Uh, let's move on to the second of the adaptation needs. Minimize, minimizing the risk of crop damage due to biological agents. Since we have uh, heard uh, very much about diseases in this session, I mean this uh, session and here also germplasm improvement is very much important the screening of existing clones for pest and disease resistance is a necessity and developing uh, with these we can develop pest and disease tolerant clones and uh, the second uh, point is improvement of land and nursery management practices in view of minimizing the risk of crop damage and here, developing recommendation of best practices of pest and disease management through improvements in nursery management and crop sanitation. These have been given priority in our R&D programs with respect to climate change adaptation. Uh, again, on to the pest and disease problem. It is important to monitor and surveillance the pest and diseases which are coming uh, existing at present. Uh, for that, there's a need to establish a surveillance program for early detection of new diseases and pests, and also developing a system uh, of forecasting risks of pests and diseases, which are relevant to actions under these adaptation options. Uh, then we move on to the third adaptation need which is enhancing resilience of export crops and agroecosystems to extreme weather events. For this, it is important to introduce suitable cropping systems with rubber, as already mentioned in the first session by the speakers. And for that land suitability assessments uh, is a necessity, and it is a routine program of our uh, soil land plant nutrition department. And to uh, this will, can be used to identify, monitor, and focus droughts. And for that, we have uh, carried out some studies on finding indicators, suitable indicators for drought monitoring and forecasting. And this can be incorporated with GIS mapping and can be used in decision-making process. And uh, it is also important to model extreme events. So for these, we need uh, climate data and therefore it is a must to uh, have 
complete databases on uh, meteorological data in all rubber growing areas. So uh, let's uh, come to the conclusion. And the R&D program of RRISL, as I mentioned, is, has adequately addressed the adaptation needs, uh, options and activities according to the National Adaptation Plan uh, of Sri Lanka. But uh, several research are still going on and at the initial stages, and therefore the recommendations uh, can be made to the industry in future. Obviously, there are research gap, and therefore need to be identified the needs, adaptation needs further, and to research on them. Uh, overarching all the said strategies, raising awareness is of immense importance. Mm -hmm. It is important to make aware the planters and smallholder farmers about the adaptation needs and proposed strategies to build resilience of the rubber sector to anticipate climate change in overcoming the adverse effects. So that is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank all the organizers uh, for inviting me to make this presentation. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasana. Now we can go to the question and answer sessions. Uh, we have uh, questions already forwarded. Have they been answered? I think we have, we have quite a number of questions for the different speakers. And uh, can you please look up the, uh, the Dropbox and respond to some of the questions? Not yet. Uh, Mr. Ashdipak, are you still around? Ah uh, yes, uh, I thought I've uh, responded to the questions. Oh yeah, the thank you very much. And then there are also questions for Dr. Chen. Dr. Chen, hello. You are you are yeah. around, Dr. Chen. Can you respond to that question? Uh, I think it's from Australia. Huh? And then which question? Ah, uh, that one. What is the question? Can you see or not? Maybe I can read uh, this for, for him. Yeah, yeah. Can you respond yeah, to yeah. that? And then further down, I think Mr. Paul, you were asking a question also. There is, there is already an effort to screen the clones, but we, at the moment, we cannot, uh, you know, because breeding is a long-term thing. So you have to screen first for the available clones to see if they have got some degree of resistance. Mr. Paul, you. So that's the response. And then uh, the next one is, who is that? Can, oh, the recording. This, I think that the, uh, Mr. Sevalatore has already responded, right? They will be given the presentations yes. at the end of the three day sessions, okay? Yes. The other one is Jacob, Dr. Ah. Jacob Matthew. I think he's very active here, Jac Jacob Matthew. Asking for the, and also some comments on the tapping panel dryness for Mr. Ashley Park. Who is asking about the cost, price, uh, cost of the treatment? I thought there's somebody, it's not very clear from you. Uh, uh, you. Uh, Liu, you. You are new. Yes. You are new. Okay. Uh, it's about 200 ringgit per hectare. Yeah. You have given, eh? you have given yes. your response? Yes, that's correct. Uh, okay, thank you. Now, do you have uh, any, any, any of the panelists or those who are around, do, do you have questions or comments on the five presentations we had for this afternoon? I have yes. one from Dr. Chen. Uh, when you talk about typhoon and cyclone, which one is more your tornado, tornado and cyclone? Which one is more prevalent in in the Hainan Island? And then what about your, you know, you have the barrier, tornado barriers, the typhoon barrier trees, are they effective? Dr. Chen? Yeah. Hello? Yes, yeah. your presentation yeah. is on tornado, and then sometimes yes, we hear. Tornado. Okay, please. And then we hear the cyclone, you know, for, for also your the typhoon. island. Yeah, typhoon is the most uh, severe disaster on Highland Island. Uh, why we choose tornado? A uh, lot of typhoon. Okay. That's what I understand. You have a lot of typhoon problem, and sometimes you have these barrier plants. 
in the areas often affected by the cyclones. Do you oh, see what's the difference? Barrier, yeah. barrier uh, plant. Yeah. Like okay, wind barrier. Windbreaker, yeah, okay. windbreaker. The difference between typhoon and tornado. They are both yes. uh, the typhoon bring a more large um, destruction on rock plantation. Uh, what the tornado is um, bring severe de uh, destruction on the root. Um, maybe uh, one kilometer uh, along the root is uh, for, for just for tornado. But the typhoon. Mm -hmm. And they, and they will destroy a large area at, uh, maybe in a uh, uh, very short time. Uh, so more damage to the trees caused by the typhoon, right? Many countries, specialists, can you Yeah, Fabi, you have a question? Dr. Fabi? So uh, the second question, is yeah. how to say the future direction of remote sensing in address the climate change on rock plantation? Okay, uh, 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 let me say. Uh, um, uh, okay, and uh, about season? Uh, what? We'll get back to you, uh, Dr. Fabi. Let uh, Dr. Chen respond to that question from Fatin. Okay. Yes, the, in virtual, the uh, image acquirability is improved, uh, especially after 2008. So we can have a, um, a big remote sensing data to monitor disaster. So uh, uh, I think the big data is uh, one of the uh, direction. That use the time series also is very important. In previous studies, most uh, study using one or two uh, cloud-free images, but uh, but now we have a, a dense time series images, so we can uh, respond more quickly, and uh, not uh, not like before. We just wait for the cloud-free images. If low cloud-free images. Large, at a large scale, so we can't do the uh, f uh, perform the disaster assessment. But now we can use partly in the uh, image that's or the partly contaminated by a cloud. But we can use the, uh, these regions lot of contaminated by cloud. So use time series uh, in that direction, and we. We can re respond more quickly to the monitor the disaster. Okay, thank you. And um, let me see, is there any other question not, not being uh, addressed? What about that? I, I, Philip Talaya, I have a question. It's not a question, it's more comment about pestalopsis. Please, please. Because we, we have seen several presentation about this showing that there is a serious outbreak of this disease recently and some uh, data linking uh, pestalotiopsis to to climatic data year by year with variability yeah. among years and uh, links to uh, likely uh, el nino phenomena but uh, i haven't seen uh, why you link this with to climate change actually because climate change it's it's different it's a continuous well, uh, trend climate that is changing the, the, over a long period due mainly to temp changes in temperature. So, so far what we have seen is links between climatic data and outbreaks of disease as we have seen in the past. It was shown for example for for, for Colitotrichum or, or Corinespora, but I'm not sure we can uh, tell that so far there is a link with climate change. This is something that we have to study, but to to tell today that yes, pestalotiopsis uh, outbreak is linked to climate change. I think we, we cannot tell this so far. We need to study it before. The, uh, thank you very much for your comments. First, this disease is of recent origin, although it was a minor disease many, many years ago. It's only end of 2016, uh, as it was observed uh, both in uh, Malaysia and also in Indonesia. 
and the immediate thing that they have done is observe the occurrence of the disease and it's important with respect to the climate change because the two presentations you can see that they highlight the importance of very heavy rainfall sustained heavy rainfall in both the two areas the difference is in the case of north sumatra the wintering period is quite similar to malaysia but in south sumatra is different because the wintering period comes around june july or it can be also extended to august so the uh, this is just they just started on the study and the immediate one is to see what sort of treatment can be given obviously there is also the contribution of the inability to purchase fertilizer to apply fertilizers so the trees have been weakened that's another aspect so it's, it's going to be a very interesting study so your observation is correct the climate change now with respect to the rainfall very heavy rainfall and the good uh, the presentation by Dr. Fabi she showed very clearly when it was dry the disease didn't occur and in april of this year two days of very heavy rain then two days after that you find the disease appearing so that is uh, just an explanation to your observation but uh, it is going to be a very interesting study and we know that there are students doing postgraduate their, their research in the different universities both in malaysia and also in indonesia and maybe other places even in australia so it's interesting it's, there is some relationship between the climate situation and occurrence of the disease you see the other thing that we observe here we are very concerned about south american leaf blight and you know that south american leaf blight the experience in brazil they have gone to the escape areas they've gone to sao paulo no problem with south american leaf blight but we did spend a large sum of money we set up the research center in trinidad and also join work with the brazilian but until today i think uh, i do not know i think the, the possibility of south american leaf blight coming here uh, we are more we are more concerned at the moment with spetsylotiopsis that is the observation because we have been uh, doing a lot of things on south american leaf blight and i think the conditions may not be right for that fungus to 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 come to this region okay any other comment Fabi, you want to say something zaida thank you yes. the, the, uh, i just want to add that actually north sumatra have eight zone uh, eight season zones so yes. uh, for uh, as you know i have uh, presented about the difference uh, between areas uh, it can uh, show us uh, it, it can show us that area with for rainy season or uh, with poor rain uh, have the thicker canopy than uh, the the area with more rainy uh, more rainfall maybe you still remember that too. Yes. maybe i will yes. understand uh, that to uh, philips uh, to the email of philips uh, about the the data you see the additional information you all have presented i think it's interesting because you are now showing the effect of uh, applying fertilizers and also spraying except we have to be concerned about how much as some people have asked the cost of giving this treatment to the trees but the the beneficial effect is already very obvious from your presentation uh, zaida and also i think fabi's work in uh, palembang and even down here, they are doing some work. You can see that uh, Mr. Ashdi Park uh, doing the treatment, and they seem to be observing some positive uh, response from those activities. Okay, any other question from uh, even the panel members or the presenters? Do you have any other questions? Uh, I have a question for you, I mean, for you, and I can open to uh, to the other panelists. Because I think uh, both Fabi and Zaida, they mentioned a couple of times uh, the need for an early warning system, right? And I think, you know, we have now new technologies and uh, in the previous session, actually there was a question related to the epidemiology study and world scale observation network to uh, address um, the impact that the increases increasing rays of temperature and uh, whatever it comes from from that uh, could have on plantations or rubber plantations 
So the question is basically, uh, these warning systems are in place in countries, for instance, in Southeast Asia. Secondly, what we can do to actually uh, set up um, not only in one country, but you know, extend cooperation in this direction among countries. Yeah, my, my response to that is when we receive this outbreak, uh, you see it's a complex disease situation. Uh, initially, it was fusicocum. You know, it's quite a standard happening after wintering. Then you get the widium coming in and then the coletotrichum, which is called the secondary leaf fall. And then another important disease is corinispora. So when this happened, we visited the fields. We went to Indonesia, we went to, uh, we went to Malaysia, and the NRPC also organized uh, a workshop in Thailand. So we brought all the experts, the disease experts. First, the visit, we formed a task force actually on just studying this pestalotiopsis. And they have made some recommendations for the R&D, and this is being actually done by the different member institutes to study the, but I think more like early warning system, at the moment there is, it's not possible to do that, except when they are monitoring only the rainfall. That is an indication. When they get the heavy rainfall, you can expect that the next few days, the disease will come. I think maybe they can respond, you know, but we brought in all the experts uh, to visit these locations. And then by the time that was over, then we found that the outbreak already went to Thailand and then Sri Lanka. Uh, although India reported only a very uh, minor sort of incidents. So that is the situation. It's going to be a very important uh, topic for research, mm -hmm. master's program or PhD program. Your comment, Zaida and Fabi, anything to, in response to Mr. Sival Salvatore's intervention? Okay. Uh, I think uh, for early warning system, we must uh, we must have obser many observation about epidemiological, and we must also know about uh, climate factor, rainfall, rainy day rain speed, humidity, uh, evaporation, and other. Uh, so, not only uh, not only uh, pestalotiopsis, but uh, other leaf fall disease we must know. Uh, and this uh, need a long observation and until maybe uh, five uh, and ten years. And we can uh, uh, cooperation with uh, many many uh, ra rubber institute in in from IDB and and other country. Maybe only that uh, that talk. Yes. So any Zaida, you have any comments on this? Zaida. Yes. Yes, that uh, you, actually... you have any comments? Yeah. yeah, maybe a little. Actually, the best and cheapest management strategy to control the, this disease is by using resistant clones. Again, like Dato said, that uh, it needs more more time and a really long uh, longer time. Uh, but according to our observation, uh, this disease will be will be long in uh, in the area if the if the condition of the uh, of the climate uh, like this, uh, more more rainfall uh, and uh, decrease of dry months, just like case uh, said, case said uh, 2007 said that in uh, Indonesia especially uh, the climate change uh, become like that, so decrease dry months and more uh, rainfall. Uh, and the increase of the temperature. The increase of temperature uh, combined with more rainfall, it, it will uh, make the, the area more humid than before. Maybe like okay. that. Um, Mr. Ashdi Park, you have any comments on this? You have been uh, working very hard to, to control this problem in your plantation? On what again, uh, that's what I missed. Uh... 
So do you, do you agree that I think more research will have to be done on this? Eh? On Pestalotia, yes. Yes, yes, Pestalotia. Because uh, Pestalotia, I, I personally think is something like COVID-19. We are unable to find any treatment at the moment. So, But we, you have some interesting clones in your plantation. Yes. What is your observation? Most of them are all susceptible or what? Uh, basically, one Malaysia is more at RM3001. Uh, I've planted about 3%. And uh, the heat on RRIN3001 is much less than other clones. That means th so, there is less incidence there? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's good. That's correct. Similarly, they are making observations also in Indonesia and Thailand uh, with respect to susceptible or resistant clones or some clones showing some degree of resistance because it's ultimately just with the coronaspora experience, the cheapest yes. way is to develop disease resistant clones. That's and correct. This is fairly new, you know, we're just in it into about four years only. So I think that's that's the we can move away from the pestalotiopsis. Anything on Wasana, Dr. Wasana, because I think it's interesting that Sri Lanka has uh, you know come out with this national adaptation plan for the climate change. I think which is interesting that the institute has taken uh, this initiative. Any any comments on that or any question? All the questions uh, yeah, submitted. Sure. Have been I, I, yes, uh, yeah, Eric, go ahead, please. Okay, Eric, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think the approach which has been taken by Sri Lanka, uh, yeah, very, very much inclusive, yes. and very much applied, uh, is a is a very very nice approach. Correct, the, and they have also the, gone to the you know gone to the field to explain to the yes growers, uh, and the R and D is also simultaneous. Out, because this, yeah. morning, this morning, uh, everybody spoke about biophysics, climate, and so on, but uh, nobody really spoke about the people. And uh, right. in fact, uh, uh, everything, uh, everything will depend on the adaptation and adoption by people. Okay, I think if you don't have any more, most of the questions in the Dropbox have been responded to, right? Already. So I think uh, I'll just take few minutes only just to wrap up this session. I think what, what we see here, whenever we have a crisis, the people hardest hit is always the poor. So no different in this case, when you have climate change issues, you have the tornado, you have the cyclone, and similarly, you have typhoon also in, in uh, around Bangladesh areas, uh, where the, if the wind speed very, very strong, the leaves just dry up because the heat the heat of the wind passing over the leaves. And similarly also, problem of not only the, the tornado or the typhoon in uh, Hainan, we also frequently get these freak storms. That's why the challenge for the plant breeders, multifold. They have also to breed clones which are fairly wind resistant. I've seen an area where a few hundred hectares, all the trees are just as if a giant has passed through and pick them up one by one and break them down. So I think the, not only disease resistance, but wind resistance. And on top of that, they have to study the, the properties of the latex and look for the uh, good sized trees, which at the end, when the plants are replanted, it goes into the furniture industry. So the, the, we have covered uh, extensively this afternoon that disease problems are very, very important. Uh, just like the experience in South American lip blight, now we are faced with a number of uh, disease problems. As the first session, it was mentioned very clearly that with climate change, disease also changes happen, and sometimes the changes are more serious for the rubber rubber growers. So I think the the uh, that's all that I need to say. But all this calls for greater cooperation, not only. As far as the breeding is concerned, the previous approaches entirely conventional breeding, which means the molecular biologists were not involved. But now, happily, that they are sitting together and see how that the molecular biologists can also contribute to this effort to produce not only resistant clones, wind resistant, and also clones, which give them the yield. The theoretical yield, they say you can get to even 8,000 kilograms per hectare per year. But we say we are happy we can get 5,000 because now the average is all below 2,000, many countries. 
So that is the approach to take. So all this calls for not only looking at the climate change issues, but also challenges before the researchers in all the member institutes and even in the industry. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the paper presenters and also the, the participation, active participation by the more than 100 over, I think, about 200, uh, 190 participants. Many not visible to us, but we hope we'll get the opportunity in the future to have the physical meeting. Then there will be, you know, that coffee break, everything, and uh, we need to strengthen the cooperation. Thank you very much to all of you, especially to our paper presenters. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and this will uh, bring to an end our day one of this uh, three days workshop. So tomorrow we will start again at uh, 2 p.m. Singapore time. Uh, and I hope that you enjoyed uh, today's sessions and uh, looking forward to see you tomorrow. So have a great day and great evening uh, from those that Thank you. are we on, only this worried on this part of the... Salvatore, <laughs> we only worried whether we can last the three days. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can, we can. We, we, we manage the first day, we can do the uh, other two. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right.